welcome to the first Sunday in Lent. We begin the journey once again together. During the Lenten season, we leave the practices of Lent behind and we celebrate little Easter's. We welcome those who participate with us in our ministry this morning through our website and through our DVD ministry. We will celebrate the practices of our faith during this season of Lent. Today, the practice of sustainability, which is the practice of care for the earth, of care for all people, and of making sure that there is enough for all. I invite you to join me as we sing together, Come and Find the Quiet Center. Brothers and sisters, I invite you to stand and share with one another a sign of the peace and the love of Jesus Christ. Join me in this morning's proclamation. Please remain standing. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. And our opening hymn, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah.
invite you to be seated. We talked with the children this morning about the practices of Lent. And look at you, you're all snuggled up there close together. I won't call you up, it's all right. <laughs> we talked about the practices of Lent and what you could do during the Lenten season rather than just give something up, how you could be kind to someone or help someone or do something nice for someone. And the kids came up with some really good ideas. And then we sang, Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. I have a list of joys and concerns. And it is lengthy this week, so I ask you, please, to keep in your prayers. Tom and Wave Starnes on the death of Tom's sister, Ruth. Sandy and Bob Paulin on the death of Sandy's father, Vern Ruska. To Bill Quinn on the death of his cousin, Marie Holenbach. To Kenneth Lineman and family on the death of his mother, Mary Jane Lynham. To Nancy Hecker on the death of her dear companion, the beloved dog, Kimo O'Connor. To Miss Emma Williamson, Sharon, and Fred Smith on the death of Sharon's sister, Miss Emma's daughter, Patty Casto. Her life will be celebrated in Ohio tomorrow, and we hope to offer a memorial service here later for her. Our concerns extend to Madeline Baker, Rose Barcelona, Anita Blanda, Barbara DeKine, Elma DeMona, Jim Downs, Diane Leach, Betty Moore, Walt Papke, Diane Pemberton, Ted Picorni, the Reverend Alan Summerfield, Betty Trudell, scheduled for surgery March 2nd, Rosemary Van Ingen, who is with us this morning, George Wall, Barbara Wirtz, Helen Wilson, who is at Milford Hospice, Joe Wilson, Stephen Cleese. We pray continued healing for those recovering from surgeries and procedures or hospitalizations, including Stu Bruce, Esther Wilson, Mary Jane Wood, and Louise Moorhead. Once again, we light the peace candle, which calls us to pray for justice and peace throughout our world. We celebrate with Reverend Jerome Tillman, our dear brother at Faith Israel, Louis Charge, who has been certified as an ordained elder. We welcome and celebrate this day new members, a baptism, and a covenant relationship. We remember with deep love our own John Sayers, who would have been 51 tomorrow. And we celebrate with Tom Pemberton, who went to Hopkins this week to learn that he was completely cancer-free. And I ask if you have joys or concerns, just raise your hand and I will bring the microphone to you. I would just like um, traveling prayers for our daughter, Colleen, who leaves Saturday on a service trip with Villanova to Belize. So an exciting time, but just keep all the students in your prayers. God bless her. How wonderful. I don't know how many of you have been following my prayers for a great-grandson, Mason Moore. He's the grandson of my daughter. Barbara Moore. He was a preemie, had a lot of problems, and he still continued to have them, although he went to AI regularly. They have found a place in Norristown, Pennsylvania. I can't ever remember the name of it, but it is a, a place where they're recommending things for my grandson to do with his son. They have a chamber. It's a long story. I'll try to make it short. They have a chamber now, which is similar to the one that deep sea divers go in. He and his dad, the little boy and his daddy, go in it three hours a day. 
and he's making wonderful progress. Every day we see something new. And Mark Moore, his father, has quit his job and he was on a rising plane with Shell Brothers to take care of his little boy 24-7. Thank you. Wonderful news, Jane. Thank you. Are there others? I just can't help getting out of my mind what's happening in Syria, and I pray thee that there will be an end to the madness that's happening there. Susan. For a very dear friend, uh, Pat Ashford, I sang in the choir with her when I was living in Florida. Pat was a tremendous help to me when I lost uh, my spouse two years ago, and unfortunately, Pat's husband died very suddenly, um, and uh, the family is really reeling from that. So I ask for prayers for Pat Ashford and family. Today is the first day of our um, Food and Love, which is the name of our soup kitchen, which we are starting here today from 2 to 4.30 for those that are out there that are hungry, not only for food, but for fellowship and just someone to talk to. So keep us in prayer as we reach out to those in need. Thank you, Penny. It's an exciting day. I'd like to have you uh, pray for someone we know by the name of Larry. Larry is a very, very lonely person. He finds it very difficult to maintain angry friendships because of his own personality type. And we've tried to befriend him. And he's going in for surgery on Monday for a hip replacement. And I think he's full of anxiety. He lives alone. And uh, just appreciate your prayers for Larry. And also for my wife, hopefully she'll be out of the hospital tomorrow. Thank you, Paul. I invite you to pray with me, brothers and sisters. Lord, we lift up these concerns to you and the concerns of our hearts, the ones that only you know. Loving God, we are called once again to the celebration of the season of Lent, to the celebration of your amazing, endless, forgiving love for each one of us. We are called to turn our focus to you and to practice our faith, to practice this week sustainability. Lent is the time we begin anew. We confess our failures to see you in all the places of the earth, in the water, in the seas, in the ground, and in the plants. We've taken these things for granted far too long, Lord. Help us to renew your earth. We confess our failure to care for your people, the times when we have been distant or removed, the times when we have refused to listen or found excuses not to act. Help us to renew your people, Lord. We confess our failure to share what we have when we have been more concerned with our own needs, with our own wants, than with seeing the needs of those around us struggling for their daily bread. Help us to renew right relationships, Lord, and to find the balance in this world that allows all people everywhere to have their basic needs. This is the season of Lent, the time when you call us back to yourself to nourish us, to renew us, so that we can renew the face of your earth. Receive our confession, Lord. Guide us and heal us. 
as we pray the prayer our Savior taught us. this morning's gospel lesson. Our reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 9, verses 46 through 56. An argument arose among them as to which one of them was the greatest. But Jesus, aware of their inner thoughts, took a little child and put it by his side and said to them, whoever welcomes this child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me, for the least among all of you is the greatest. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not stop him, for whoever is not against you is for you. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. This is the word of God for the people of God.
Thank you for inviting me to fill the pulpit at Epworth here this morning. I feel very honored, especially since it's the first Sunday of Lent. I also want to thank the Bell Choir for that version of uh, Jesus Loves Me. It's such an appropriate song for Lent. It has a very interesting background, and I must tell you a little about it. It was written, the words to Jesus Loves Me were written by two sisters who lived up the Hudson River in West Point, and they wrote it in a novel that came out of their Sunday school experience. And it was later set to music by a hymn writer and who added the verse that was not in the original text. And it became such an important song in the Sunday school movement, which was so strong in this country in the late 19th century and then entered into our regular worship. Sorry for that little digression, but um, it's something that uh, is really quite interesting. (laughs) Will you pray with me? Oh God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you. Amen. Forty days or so on the road. No, I'm not going to tell you about the characters in Jack Kuriak's famous novel, a classic on the road, and I'm not going to describe a Bob Hope and Bing Crosby movie trip to Rio or Morocco or Mandalay. The road I have in mind this morning is two roads, really. One historical, a road that ran from the small cities and rural towns of Galilee in the north of Palestine southward toward Jerusalem in the, in the Judea, in the southern part of that land. And it is also a symbolic uh, road, a figurative road, that describes the spiritual journey that each of us, and Epworth as a congregation, will take between now and Easter. We count Lent as 40 days, including six Sundays, beginning with Ash Wednesday but some denominations count it other ways, so that it has more than 40 days, and it would for us if we counted Sundays, which we don't do. But let's take 40 as a symbol. In the Bible, 40 means a good while. The Hebrews wandered in the desert for 40 years. Jesus was tempted for 40 days as he began his ministry. So it makes great biblical sense for us to observe a 40-day period of preparation for Easter, for the crucifixion and the resurrection. In our scripture reading for the day, we heard the account of the point where Jesus himself and his group turned to go to Jerusalem. In this passage, remember the, the line, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. This passage is closely aligned with with Ash Wednesday, which we have just celebrated this week, the start of Lent. And in the book of Luke, the period from the time Jesus in chapter 9, verse 51, sets his face to go to Jerusalem, and his arrest in chapter 22, more than half of the gospel of Luke takes place on the road. It's the time in the ministry of Jesus as presented by Luke where the great parables take place. The Good Samaritan, the Prodigal Son, the Lost Sheep, the Mustard Seed. The Lord's Prayer is in chapter 11 and a longer account of the blessing of the children in chapter 18. It is a time where Jesus is challenged by various political factions who are opposed to what he's doing. And on the road... Perhaps in 40 days, Jesus spelled out the meaning of his ministry and traced the future of what would become the church. There's much too much material in that journey to even outline here. But I want to lift up three characteristics of Jesus that are prominent in this road trip that can strengthen and instruct us on our Lenten pathway in 2012. 
Lent is a time of penitence and self-denial, as Reverend Pat mentioned in talking about to the children earlier. We often associate it as a time to give up something, especially something we like. But it's also a time to add on something, something we need. So I would like to suggest that we consider adding on these three characteristics of Jesus that were so evident on the road as he went toward Jerusalem. First, Jesus went, a, a, he went against the social grain in his movements, his associations, and his teachings. Secondly, he empowered others to do God's work. And three, he held up a mirror of humility. Going against the grain. Jesus never went along with social or political or economic or even religious practices that he considered at odds with God's purposes. We can see this in his travel plans, in the company he keeps, and what he said on 40 days on the road. This verse is in our scripture lesson for the day. He entered a village of the Samaritans. Now, that sounds rather much like a travel log to us. But in the first century, that was a very radical thing to do for a Jew to go to a village of the Samaritans. The Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along at all. They disagreed about everything. They were cousins historically and of the faith, but one of them had a temple here and one had a temple there, and they were always at odds. Samaria was in the middle of Palestine, between Galilee on the north, where Jesus lived, and Judea on the south, where Jerusalem was located, and most Jews wouldn't even walk through there. They crossed the river and went across on the other side, and went way out of their way. Jesus often went to the Samarian territories. He didn't pay any attention to the intercultural struggles of these two groups. And remember, the Samaritans didn't want him there either because he was going to Jerusalem. But Jesus paid no attention to that. He went against the grain to underscore the breadth of God's love and care. Another dramatic example comes a little later in uh, chapter 18 where Jesus is in, Jerusalem, in Judea, outside of Jerusalem, in the ancient city of Jericho. And there's this man in a tree. He's short, probably, and he wants to see the Jesus parade. But Jesus tells him to come down. And not only does he call him down and talk to him, but he goes home with him for lunch, which was a very, very unusual thing for Jesus to do. Zacchaeus, that's his name, was a, a tax collector, a Roman tax collector. He was on contract to the Roman occupiers, the military occupiers, to squeeze money out of the people. And usually it was the little people that got squeezed the hardest. Tax collectors were considered great sinners. Proper people didn't associate with them. But Jesus didn't let the bad reputation of Zacchaeus bother him. He reached out to him in ministry. Zacchaeus changed his way. But even then, I expect there were a lot of wagon heads in Jericho saying, see that man over there? He associates and even goes home and sits with tax collectors, with sinners. I hope that Jesus still eats with sinners because most of us could take him home with us because we need Jesus sitting with sinners because that is what most of us are and need to have our lives changed. A quick third example of how Jesus went against the grain on the road. Chapter 14, another meal, this time at the house of a Pharisee. Now, the Pharisees didn't like Jesus very much, but Jesus nevertheless reached out to them, and he had accepted an invitation to come and eat with this Pharisee. And as he came up to the door, there's a sick man lying there. Not unusual, sick people in that day and time often gathered around the household of the prosperous hoping for some sort of sustenance or, or handout. 
But this day happened to be the Sabbath. And for Jesus to heal this man would go against the prohibition against work on the Sabbath. What was Jesus going to do? We know what he did. He healed the man. And in this act of compassion and kindness, he stirred up a lot more animosity against him. We of this congregation and of this time and place need to ask ourselves on our road to Jerusalem if we are willing to go to unusual places, associate with unpopular people, and to go against custom to spread the word of God. I can't give you a checklist of what kind of, of events may be out there for you in your 40 days, but we are asked the question, where does our presence, our acceptance of people, and our unexpected actions witness to God's love? Secondly, empowering others to do God's work. Jesus empowered people to be whole and happy and helpful. He empowered people to achieve their fullest potential. He empowered bodies and minds through healing. He empowered the spirit through his teachings about the truth of God's love. And not least, he empowered people to share in God's mission. Jesus called disciples at the very beginning of his ministry, as we heard in our gospel lesson a few weeks ago. And these were working disciples. This was not an entourage of people around Jesus to make him look important, as though he were on television. It was a working movement, and there were more than 12 of these guys, and they weren't all guys. The 12 may have been, but the Gospel of Luke makes it very clear that Jesus had female disciples, and there were more than 12 folks. And they moved around with Jesus. Sometimes, maybe they were local disciples. Jesus would come through teaching, and they would walk with Jesus for a day or two, and maybe spend the night, and then they'd go home. Some of the disciples even probably went home from time to time to work. Peter, James, and John to fish. I'm sorry I forgot you all were back there. <laughs> because I see choir robes over here, so I was <laughs> sorry about that. And Jesus empowered his disciples to do some of the work, some of the work of healing, some of the work of teaching. And one of the most dramatic examples comes in the 10th chapter of Luke, the biggest commissioning of missionaries in the early church. Jesus sends 70 of his followers in teams of two to prepare the way to spread the word they are to take very little with them. They are to accept the hospitality that they are given. They are not supposed to shop around to find a better home to stay in or somebody that has a better cook. They are to accept what they're offering. This is a very thrilling story for me because for many years I've related on an almost daily basis to the missionaries of our United Methodist Church. We have so many great men and women who are all over the world, more than 62 countries, who have been empowered by their contact with Jesus to go into mission for us and to empower others. And these missionaries, they take very little with them. They have to accept the hospitality that is given to them, but they're goal is to empower others to also become disciples of Jesus. Our missionaries today are literally from everywhere to everywhere. We have missionaries from Brazil and New Jersey and from Cambodia and from the Congo in Cambodia and from Colombia in Costa Rica and from China in Oklahoma and from the Philippines in Japan. They are doctors and nurses and agronomists and accountants and administrators and relief workers and preachers. Some of them are preachers. You don't need a lot of preachers if you've got a lot of good lay people. And they're always working with the local folk to form communities of faith with indigenous or local leadership. That is so important in mission that the people are empowered to become the community 
of disciples. Empowerment in mission can take many amazing forms. I think of a couple from Wisconsin who were themselves refugees from Southeast Asia who felt called to go to Laos where they accepted the hospitality of strangers and were soon organizing Bible studies and house churches. The people they were reaching out to were all very poor and there was no money to build a church. There was no money to buy hymnals or to buy Sunday school materials. There was no money to have a regular preacher. But the folks got together. What could they do about this? Well, for one thing, they discovered there was a big local market for mushrooms. And the climate was excellent for growing mushrooms. So a part of the mission of the church came to be to get mushroom settings so that people could begin their own crops, they could sell some to sustain their own families, and they could help to support the church with what was left over. This becomes a symbol of the empowering chain of God's love. Our missionaries are often assisted by volunteers who come for two weeks, a month, a year. Some of you in this very church have been such volunteers who reach beyond our own life here into the world. Mission into all the world is what Jesus started on the road outside of a Samaritan village, an out-of-the-way place empowering disciples who then empowered others in God's mission. I wish I had time this morning to describe the role that the eastern shore of the Chesapeake played in the mission story of this country and this denomination. We often think of ourselves as a little out of the way in terms of geography, but it was in this out of the way place that the earliest American missionaries put down their roots, Methodist missionaries put down their roots, and the gospel began to be disseminated across this country and across the world. We are not out of the way. We need to ask ourselves how we in this church are empowering others to become disciples. Are we making room for newcomers in the leadership? because that's one of the ways that empowerment is measured. Third, Jesus on the road to Jerusalem held up a mirror of humility. Across his ministry, Jesus punctured the pretensions of the proud and the pompous. This included puncturing the pomposity of his own disciples at times. In the reading for the morning, we heard that the disciples were involved in the discussion about which one of them was the most important. Now, that's not something you usually think about disciples of Jesus doing, but it apparently happened because it's mentioned too many times. It's one of the reasons that we always have to confess our sins when we come to worship, because we have such a temptation to follow the disciples in that respect. In the 14th chapter of Luke, there are a number of parables that show the very strong point that it is not good Christian discipleship to seek to be honored more than others. These are mostly parables about the dinner table, about the banquet, and in each one of them, The point is, don't think that you need to get the best place at the banquet or that you're going to get a lot of special plays because you've got a lot of money to give big dinners. That, Jesus said, is not how it works. The best place, of course, at a banquet is near the host, which is probably going to be near the food. Have you ever been to a buffet dinner, a self-service buffet dinner that was served by table numbers and you had a low number? makes you feel like you wish you had a number up toward the top. But be glad you've got the low number. Because Jesus' point is that we take the more humble way. Jesus constantly stressed the point that riches, money, does not count for anything. 
in the kingdom of God that the poor always go in first. The poor always go in first. This is one of the primary emphasis of the great religious reformers over the years. Francis of Assisi, Martin Luther, John Wesley, Mother Teresa of today, reminding people, calling people to humility, to trust not in wealth, but in Jesus. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, lived in the 18th century as the Industrial Revolution built its factories on the backs of the poor. It hurt him deeply. He battled child labor. He battled the industrial pollution of the water and the soil and the air. He was an early environmentalist, and he would be very proud of us for being concerned this Lent with sustainability of the natural order and also of developing a safe and sustainable food resources. John Wesley was finally thrown out of the church. He was thrown out of the Anglican church for holding the rich responsible for many of the problems in society. They told the man, you can't talk here anymore. So he went and turned his father's tombstone into a pulpit. And the people followed him out into the field in the cemetery to hear his message. The church today has a big responsibility to stand against pridefulness, against those who would degrade the poor, and those who would degrade the environment. I expect it's harder today to be humble than it was in John Wesley's day. Wesley didn't have to contend with the communications media. And you don't find much that is humble or compassionate on television or on the internet at least nothing that's easy to find. What you find is the adoration of wealth and the elevation of celebrity over integrity. The media moguls say, well, that's what the people want. They want celebrity gossip. Is that what we really want in the media? Do you really, in your heart, care a lot about what the Kardashians do? <laughs> do you really want to hear the social views of the judges on American Idol? Do you really want to hear about the domestic troubles of rock stars and ball players? The church has to be a counterbalance today against commercialization of life, of the elevation of pride, of the worship of riches and celebrity that we have in our media. I tell you, I don't have any children or grandchildren, but if I did, I would worry about the models that they are receiving through the media today in terms of, 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 of an understanding of the very meaning of what it means to be alive. The church has a responsibility to model humility and compassion for children and for young adults and for adults. Now I must summarize all of these points. For Lent is upon us. We are on the road with Jesus for the next 40 days or so. So in this period, can we pay close attention to him in the activities of our everyday life? See how Jesus goes to unexpected places associates with unpopular people, and does unusual things. Are we with Jesus? Watch how he empowers others to engage in God's mission, and how those empowered then empower others. Are we following that example? Look in the mirror of humility that Jesus holds up. Are we engaged with the poor? Are we standing against the cult of celebrity? Are we protecting the earth? Up here there is a, a Lenten labyrinth. It's to be walked upon. And I hope that sometime during this Lenten period you will come into the church and you will come up here and you will walk. 
and that you will think about being on the road to Jerusalem as you walk. And think about how you prepare to receive God's love. But you can't be in the church building all the time, walking on a labyrinth. So wherever your footsteps take you over the next 40 days, know that you are on the road to Jerusalem with Jesus. Amen. Sisters, please stand and sing. So this morning we have several members to welcome. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation through water and the Spirit. And this is God's gift offered to us without price. Through the reaffirmation of faith, we renew the covenant declared at baptism acknowledge what God is doing for us, and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. This morning, I present these persons today for reception into Epworth. At 12.30 after this service, Jeffrey Allen Workman, Jr. will be baptized. And this morning at the 9.30 service, we received Sherry Kane, Joan DiMiani, Donna Sprout, Randy Sprout. And at this service, we offer welcome to Colin James. Since the earliest times, the vows of Christian baptism have consisted first of the renunciation of all that is evil and then the profession of faith and loyalty to Christ. As we celebrate the baptism of Jeffrey today, and of those who will reaffirm their faith, we have the opportunity to share in their commitment to renew our life in Christ's fashion by water and the Spirit. So then, let us all respond to the historic questions that mark our lives as disciples of Christ. 
First, I will address these questions to Colin. Colin, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and the power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. I do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as our Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, say, I do. I do. And now to the congregation, do you? as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? If so, say, we do. We do. We do. Will, you Will you nurture, nurture one, one another in, in the, the Christian, Christian faith and life and include, and include these persons now before you in, in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. Members of the household of God, we commend these persons to your love and care. Will you nurture one another in Christian faith and life and include them in your care, and do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members with you in the body of Christ and in Epworth, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our witness, our gifts, and our service, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Will you help welcome our newest member? always when we welcome new members. And by way of introduction, again, I want to thank Elliot for being present with us this morning. Many of you know him and recognize him. He is a regular attender at the 11 o'clock service. He is uh, Reverend Dr. Elliot Wright. He was ordained in Tennessee, and his membership is still in the Tennessee Conference. He has been connected for 20 years to the General Board of Global Ministry, which oversees UMCOR, United Methodist Committee on Relief, and we are blessed to have him with us this day. A few brief announcements to share with you. Our Lenten season has indeed begun. Lenten devotions on Wednesday night include a very simple supper, bread and um, soup, and then time for prayer together here in the sanctuary. Our labyrinth will be available throughout the week. There are instructions and guides for the labyrinth out on the table in the, ch in the narthex chancel table. If you've never walked it before, it is a wonderful experience, and I encourage you to participate. Saturday food and faith, it is a potluck breakfast to bring 
muffins or donuts or bagels or something to share with the group and then break up into discussion groups. There are programs everywhere from Methodist history to instructions or conversations about our general conference to an art class and a class on Lazarus the musical. There is so much being offered. I encourage you, if you have not signed up, to look into these classes and these opportunities for spiritual growth. When you leave the sanctuary space, the sign-up table is to your right. There is a Lenten booklet available in the narthex. This has all the dates and activities that are happening here during the Lenten season all the way through to Easter Sunday. Take one for yourself and your family. Take one to give to someone else, to a neighbor or a friend or someone that you would like to bring here to Epworth. These are in the narthex as well. Our annual World Day of Prayer is held here on uh, Friday at 1 o'clock. Women will gather. Everyone is welcome. This is an event that happens worldwide annually on this first Friday in March. We are honored to be able to host it here at Epworth. There will be time for prayer and then a brief gathering and fellowship afterwards. I invite you to put that on your calendar. Beyond the Gates, a ministry for those who are transitioning from prison. It offers the opportunity for men who have been incarcerated to participate in mock job fair, to participate with others and be trained in what it's like to go through an interview process and to experience that before they actually come into the world and start looking for work. It's a very important ministry. Kim Book has the information about it. I encourage you to find her if you can help or participate in any way. Next week, we're back to three, three services. First Sunday in March, we move back into our regular schedule. So for those of you who have been joining us at the 9.30 and the 11, there will be an 8 o'clock next week. We will welcome Jonathan and Donna back into our midst and celebrate by having three services. It will be wonderful. <laughs> Today, as Penny mentioned, please keep in mind our soup kitchen opens at 2 o'clock. If you are not able to help, please keep that ministry in your prayer. So important, so needed in our community at this time. And what a blessing that we are able to offer it here at Epworth. Do we have anyone worshiping with us for the first time today? First time, first time, first time, first time, first time visitors. Excellent. You are a blessing to us. The ushers have a small gift for you. We consider you part of our church family just by having you here. Thank you for blessing us this way. Brothers and sisters, I invite you to pray with me. Gracious, loving, amazing God, you call us to the journey of Lent, and you put our feet on the path that you would have us go. Take who we are, Lord, take what we have and use it in this world that we may be a blessing wherever you would have us go. All that we have, we have received from you. Let us then give it back to brothers and sisters in our world desperate to hear the words of your love, to hear the good news of your mercy and your presence among us. Let all that we do let all that we are be done. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Please stand. Please be seated. <clears throat> 